So defining networks. Uh, in this, we're going to talk about the different ways we define networks, whether it's by geography, topology, or resourcing. So first, when we talk about networks, we have to understand what a network is. A network is a group of computers, peripherals, and software that we connect together to use for a common good or a common purpose. Um, to have a network, you really only need two things. You need at least two computers that would create, or two devices, and that would create your network. If you take two or more computers and connect them together inside of an office, this is usually what's called a local area network because it's a local connection. It's very close to you. Uh, lands that are in different cities, and if you connect them together, they become part of what's called a wide area network. And the biggest wide area network out there is the internet because we're connecting lots of different people in lots of different cities across the world. So when we look at it by, by geography, we start with what's closest to us and move our way out. A PAN, which is a personal area network, is basically around a person. It's a couple of meters. Uh, as you go out further, you go to a LAN. That might be your office building or an office floor. You go to a MAN, that's going to go across your city. And if you go to a WAN, you're talking across the country or across the world. And we'll talk about each of these more in the next couple of slides. The first one we're going to talk about is PAN, which is Personal Area Network. It's a very small network, much smaller than a local area network. Its range is usually limited to just a few meters. So great, connection, uh, great examples of this is if you have a USB hard drive connected to your laptop, that is actually considered a personal area network because you have a, the universal serial bus is acting as a network to connect it. If you have a Bluetooth uh, cell phone and it's connected to your car, that is a personal area network between your cell phone and your car. It is a personal network that those two devices can communicate to stream your music, or play your, uh, your phone call over your speaker system. As we go out, we start talking about a local area network. And this is probably the most common network that most people think of. This is the network you have in a local area, something like your house or your school. So if you're at home and you have um, your Comcast or your Verizon uh, internet service coming to your house, you'll use a wireless network in your house. That wireless network is the local area network. Um, this has a limited distance. In an office building, it's generally a couple of hundred meters, um, and with wireless, it's usually less than a hundred meters. And usually this will consist of either Ethernet, which is wired networks, or Wi-Fi, which is your wireless networks. And the two standards for that are 802.3 and 802.11. And we'll talk more about those in separate lectures of the details of each of those standards. Next, as we move out, we talk about metropolitan area networks, or MANs. And what a MAN is, the word metropolitan is talking about a city. So these are networks that are going across a city or across a county. Um, they're larger than a LAN, but smaller than a WAN. So a good example of that is we're here at Anne Arundel Community College. We're at the cyber campus. The main campus is about 20 miles down the road in Arnold, right? We're still on the same network as them because we're on the MAN. Okay? So each campus has its own LAN, and we connect those two LANs together to create a MAN, a metropolitan area network. Then if we connect to the internet, we now become part of the WAN and we get into the wide area network. So as you build these networks, they get bigger and bigger and go further and further distances. The biggest place you're going to see MANs is usually in government, uh, military, um, and school environments where you're going to have multiple places separated out throughout the county or throughout the city. Uh, if you look at the DMV, right, the Department of Motor Vehicles, they've got numerous locations all throughout Anne Arundel County. All of those are tied back together through a MAN, through a metropolitan area network, which is a private network that only they are on. Whereas if you go on the internet, everybody has access to it. And that brings us to the WAN, the Wide Area Network. This is going to connect our network that are, that are geographically separated. So for instance, if I have an office in Los Angeles and I have an office in New York, I can connect those two corporate locations and create a wide area network. They can be private and still maintain their own network, just those, those people on their own network, or they can be part of the larger public network like the internet. Uh, for example, if you look at the military, they have military bases all over the world, and they have their own network, their own wide area network, that covers the entire world that is completely separate from the internet. So they can have stuff going from Japan to Washington, D.C., and it won't even touch the internet. It'll all be in that private network, which is a large WAN because of the size of it. Um, the most common uh, WAN you'll use as an everyday user is obviously the internet, right? You can get on the internet right now and start going to websites in Japan or in Singapore from here in DC. Yes? Uh, do you put the geography in the as well? Yeah, um, 
CAN is covered by Network Plus. They don't cover it in A Plus. You don't need to know it for that. But essentially, CAN is what we call a campus area network. Um, it's smaller than a, a MAN, but larger than a WAN. So a good example of that is if you go to the Arnold campus, right? They have a LAN for each building. So you got the cult building where the computer guys are. They have one. Then you go to the fine arts building, the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but the fine arts building. Uh, they have their own LAN in that building. And when you connect all these buildings together in this one or two square mile radius, that's a campus area network. And then if we tie multiple campuses together, we get to the MAN. Yeah. Another place you'll see this commonly used is business parks. So if you go work uh, for uh, down the road here, uh, National Business Parkway, um, COPT owns like 20 buildings over there and they lease it out to a bunch of people. All those buildings are tied together with their networks. That's a campus area network. It's, it's within a mile or two radius. Um, and all those buildings are tied together. And each building has its own local network, and those local networks are tied together to extend the distance across the buildings. Because if I'm a big company um, or a big government agency, right, um, I might have three buildings that I'm using, even though they're all in the same area. And they're too big for each, for all of them to be on one land, so they become a can. Yeah. Good question. The next way that we define our networks is by resources. We can do a client server model or a peer-to-peer -peer model. So if we're doing a client server model, it's going to provide us a dedicated server that will give us accesses to files and scanners and printers and other resources for our clients to use. As you can see in this picture, all of the clients on the outside are reaching back to the file server in the center to get their information. The nice thing about this is it makes our job easy for administration and backup. Because if you wanted to backup all the files, you only have to go to one place, the server, to do it, right? If we had to do this from all the clients, we have to go to six places in this example. So this centralizes all your administration and it centralizes all of your backup. This is the way most businesses will operate in a client server method. The second way we can do things is in a peer to peer. And we do a peer to peer, every computer is sharing resources through another peer. And so they all are connected to each other, as you can see here. The problem with this is it makes our administration and backup very difficult. Because if I want to back up all the files associated with my business, I have to go to all six machines individually. Before, I could just go to the one server because that's where everything was stored. And so this adds to a lot of administrative burden for us and a lot of security issues. So in most businesses, we're not going to use peer-to-peer. -peer. We're going to end up using a client-server relationship. The third way we can define our networks is by topology. And when we do our topology, there's two types. There is the physical topology, which is how the cables are physically run. And there's the logical topology, which is how the network actually flows with the data. They don't have to be the same. So for instance, I can have a physical star network where all the cables are going back to a central switch while running a logical ring network across that. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. So the first one we're going to talk about is a bus topology. Basically, this is the most common network um, in the old days. We would take a single cable and run it down the length of the building. And anybody who wants to connect in would simply tap into it using a T-connector or a vampire, a vampire tap. And what a vampire tap was, was essentially it was a, um, a connector that had almost looked like a tooth. It was a metal tooth that would actually clamp into the wire to make the electrical connector. And that would allow that computer to get onto the network that way. Um, it's an older technology, and we don't use this very often anymore at all. You'll be very unlikely to see this in the field. Um, if you do see it, it's probably some old legacy network from the 1980s or 1990s, um, and it uses either what's called thick net or thin net, um, and they're referenced as 10 base 5 and 10 base 2. And we'll talk more about those notations when we get into the Ethernet chapter. Uh, you'll see that come back up again. A ring topology. With the uh, bus topology, if you had a break in the cable, you ended up having the network got disconnected from each other. So the person on the left side of the bus couldn't talk to the person on the right side of the bus. With the ring, it added a little bit more redundancy because it had a circular loop. And essentially, every device connects to the ring, and the data will travel around the ring in one direction. Um, with fiber networks, fiber backbones, they tend to use two rings. So they have one going clockwise and one going counterclockwise to provide you counter-rotating rings for redundancy. So if one ring got broken, there was still a second connection up. So rings gave you more redundancy than a bus did. Um, essentially, the nice thing about a ring is that each device waits for what they call a token, and they pass that token around. And when the device has the token, it can talk. And when the uh, device doesn't have a token, it won't talk. So there won't be any collisions on there. Uh, if you think about a classroom, right? if we have 30 people in the class, 
and everybody wanted to talk whenever they wanted, nobody would hear each other because they'd all be screaming over each other. Instead, if I have, like in kindergarten, you guys ever have the talking bear? And, you know, the person who had the talking bear was able to talk and everybody else had to listen. And then when you were done talking, you'd pass the bear to the next person and they would talk. That's how a token ring works. You know, I have my ring, I talk, and then I pass the ring to the next person, and then they talk. Excuse me, I have the token and I talk. The most common one that we use, though, is called a star topology. And essentially, all your devices will connect back to a single point, usually a switch or a hub. In modern networks, it's almost always a switch. Um, this is the most popular physical LAN topology today. It's what we're using in this classroom and what you use at home, uh, whether you knew it or not. It's commonly used for Ethernet. Um, you take your RJ45 cabling, whether that's 10 base T, 10, 100 base T, etc. Uh, we'll talk about those again in Ethernet chapter. Uh, or you can use wireless, or you can use fiber. Any of those three will work with a star. But the problem with a star is if everything, if the central device fails, then the entire network goes down. So if everything's connecting back to the switch and the switch loses power, my whole network goes down. Whereas with a ring, if one computer went down, it didn't matter. It would just keep communicating around that computer. So a little less redundant, but it is easier to manage, easier to expand, and easier to use. The next one we're going to talk about is called a full mesh topology. And this is by far the most redundant topology that we have out there. It gives us the most capability because every node connects to every other node. So as you can see here, we have six computers, and every single one of them has a network cable going between themselves and another computer. The nice thing about this is there's always optimal routing. Every computer can go directly to the other computer without having to go through an intermediary. Um, the problem with these is they get very expensive to maintain and they get very complicated. They also get very large very quickly. So if I have two people, how many connections do I need? Two. Me and him are just holding hands. We have one connection between us and we only have one connection for two people. If we have three people, we're going to have uh, three connections, right? Because we're making a triangle. Four, it starts getting bigger. Five, it gets bigger. Six, it gets bigger. So for instance, here we have six. And if we use our calculation of six times five divided by two, that would be 15. So if you count these wires up here, there are 15 wires between those six computers. It's quite a bit, but not too horrible. What happens if I put 50 computers on this network? You guys know how much that would be? 1,225 connections. See how unwieldy this gets pretty darn quickly, right? Um, this is the problem with having a full mesh topology. This is why you won't find this in most businesses. Generally, if you're going to find a mesh topology, you're going to find this being used from backbone switches to backbone switches. So you only have three or five switches, then it's usable. But the actual uh, clients being attached to the network, they're still going to be used under a star topology. Okay? Because again, it just gets way too unwieldy way too quickly. Uh, yes, yeah. so if you're using a hub, um, it wouldn't be a mesh. If you're going back to a hub, it's still going to be a star because you're going back to a central point, whether it's a hub or a switch. So a partial mesh. Because meshes can become so unwieldy, they developed a thing called a partial mesh, where not everybody connects to everybody else, but our high-priority routes will connect to each other. So we give optimal routing between some sites while avoiding the expense of connecting every site. And you consider your traffic patterns when you're designing this effectively. So, for instance, let's say I had a company that had six locations. And maybe this bottom location here was in, um, I don't know, Fargo, North Dakota, right? That's kind of a small place. And I have some locations in D.C. and New York that have a lot of traffic. So the, tra the ones that have a lot of traffic, like say maybe this one was my D.C. server and this one's my New York server, they have connections to multiple places um, but this one in Fargo, North Dakota, if he wants to go to my DC server, he's going to have to go up through, I don't know, Chicago and then down to DC, right? So it's more of a hub and spoke method um, when you have this partial mesh. Not everybody connects to everybody else, but you do have multiple connections between certain high priority sites. So uh, which of these describes a network topology most commonly used in small office, home office switched networks? Would it be a mesh, a hybrid, a bus, or a star? Which one did I say was the most common? The star network, right? And that is the most often used in small office, home office networks, as well as in large corporations. You're going to find star networks everywhere.